The Last of Us Part 2 is a weird game to me. Like, while there are aspects I adore and hate about the game, I don't think Part 2 is a masterpiece nor a downright awful game. At least not in the same way I've critiqued other games on this channel before. For one, the gameplay is solid, the AI is smart, the gunplay feels satisfying, and I've seen people do some crazy cool stuff with the new mechanics. And some of the set pieces are downright gorgeous, so no glaring problems for me in this category. So part 2 is bad because of the story, right? I mean... It's a bit more complicated than that, because I like what this game has to offer. Like, by a lot. I like how more complex the story and relationships are compared to the first. The ideas the sequel explores felt less like a pastiche of familiar post-apocalyptic stories, and more like a story with something unique to its own world. And they take the narrative and characters in a sensible direction that Part 1's foundation created. So from a pure cutscene-only perspective, I've got my problems, but it's far from the worst story I've ever seen. So, why am I talking about this game? If I feel lukewarm about the gameplay and story, what aspect about Part 2 makes me want to critique it? Well, the gameplay and story. I swear I'm not being stupid or obtuse on purpose, so let me explain. While individually these two things are fine in their own right, it's when I stop assessing these components individually and start seeing how they're implemented together, I feel the game becoming less than the sum of its parts, and I felt a disconnect with the game that I found really interesting. Specifically, I felt a disconnect with what the game wants me to feel with its narrative and how it's conveyed through its gameplay. And as you know, narrative is gameplay and gameplay is narrative. So when Part 2 wants to make me feel something with its narrative, but it doesn't give me the space, tools, or scenes to explore these feelings with its gameplay, that's where I think my biggest issues with the game lies. Now, given this statement, let's take a step back and look at how these narrative-driven games are structured. While the Last of Us series clearly presents itself in segments where there's gameplay and then there's cutscenes, the story just doesn't stop happening as soon as we gain control of our characters. If they were completely disconnected, we may as well pause a movie, grab a Rubik's Cube, and only play the movie when you're done solving it. This would be nonsense. So in The Last of Us Part 1, Gameplay, obviously, has narrative purpose and is contextualized. The gameplay is gunplay, and that gunplay is violence, and that violence reinforces Joel's character. At his best, he's a charming man who cares about his loved ones, willing to go above and beyond to do anything for them. But at his worst, he's a desperate man numb to violence and will go above and beyond to kill anyone to reach his goals. Is this a man who's retained his humanity to save the person he loves, or is he a monster, unwilling to give up his selfish desires? You just come after her. After this moment, we take control of Ellie as we complete the game's epilogue through her perspective, where we see Joel's goal isn't met with praise, instead, it's met with unease. Now, with the second game, coming off of the heels of that ending, the tone of the narrative becomes more depressing, somber, and dramatic, because the game revolves around the ramifications of Joel's actions. Specifically, Joel's decision to kill the people who could have made a cure, and the reactions that came from that. Because when you lay out what he's done, a man who's killed the last remaining doctors who could have found a cure, He's basically a villain, and regardless of how illogical the logistics of curing the world seems, Joel robbing the world of that possibility, no matter how impossible it seems, will cause a lot of heartache and distress for anyone who believed that there was a chance. Ellie feels like Joel robbed her of that agency and she feels that weight on her shoulders. And because of this weight, because she was robbed of this choice, 
Ellie can't seem to bring herself to forgive Joel, despite the amount of love she has for him. And the only person to rival that weight is Abby, who aims to kill the guy who robbed the world of not only the cure, but her dad. So, Joel kills dad, Abby kills Joel, Ellie aims to kill Abby. That means part two's narrative explores the cycle of revenge, which has the characters go to insane lengths in order to get closure they think they'll receive. And by partaking in this cycle, the game wants to make you feel bad, horrified even, and in conflict with the protagonists. While you come to understand the drastic actions of these characters, it wants you to feel miserable by going the distance and then feel a sense of regret for those actions. To quote co-game director Anthony Newman, In this game, it's about how far would you go, how much of your humanity would you lose in trying to seek vengeance or seek justice against those who have wronged you. And since the devs want you to feel guilty about your actions, they've added a few things to humanize the NPCs. Like increasing the brutality to make it feel more real, to make you feel squeamish. NPCs will call out each other's names whenever a person or their dog goes missing. They even yell out in shock and grieve when they find out someone's dead. They've implemented these things to start a conversation about the cycle of violence, alongside the effects of systemic trauma. So you have a quote like this. These aren't just faceless goons that you're fighting, these are real people. It's all in service of making the violence feel that much more real. So cool. The game wants to make us feel bad by making the game feel more real. So with all this effort, was this effective? At least for me? Not really. And before I get into that, I need to talk about Joel. I think what made Joel work was him being a pragmatic guy in a kill or be killed post-apocalypse. And these components lend itself well to video game conventions. Who you control is considered good, and the opposition is considered bad. You good, he bad, no ludonarrative dissonance here. But evidently, part one's ending is supposed to bring attention to these conventions through Joel's violence. Joel sees this as just, but Ellie is forced to confront the reality of Joel's actions. She might not know the specifics, but she knows something's up. Joel, as likable as he can be, did something horrible. And this rug pull is what ties part one together as a narrative. The things you do for love. But in part two, it doesn't do that rug pull. Instead, it immediately brings attention to the horrific things you're doing. Which makes sense, you can't just repeat the first game. How can you pull a rug if the rug's already been pulled? But here comes an interesting effect by doing this. If you are someone who is genuinely distraught at the thought of shooting and killing these NPCs, you're not in the same headspace as Ellie. Which is pretty bold. If the game is having its intended effect, it's as if the game is punishing you for just playing the game. Counterpoint though, I don't think it's supposed to like discourage you exactly, but exemplify the amount of misery Ellie is inflicting on others. The misery is for you to witness and acknowledge while Ellie is blind to it all. This feeling is easier to swallow in passive media because we're viewers to the event unfolding. But in games, being in control gives the feeling that we're directly responsible for the game's events, even though we know it's scripted. This is why games usually involve characters who are likable or are inoffensive blank slates. They do agreeable things to decrease the chances of you disconnecting with the character. So you feel good because they do good things. And on occasion, a game will implement the illusion of choice to give you a sense of agency. And there's nothing inherently wrong with illusions of choice, especially in a fixed narrative. Because branching narratives are hard to pull off and a production creep nightmare. So choices are more about instilling a feeling in the moment. So something like Tell Tales of the Walking Dead ends the same way, but at least these illusions feel like you're responding to the world in a way that you would. Sure, you're playing as Lee, who already has a background and personality, 
but most people react and play based on who they are and their personal biases. Morally, it's best for Max to rewind time and let Chloe die. But people love Chloe so much that they're willing to let the butterfly effect do its thing and sacrifice an entire town for Chloe. As crazy as that sounds, games at least give us that satisfaction that passive media couldn't. So games are a medium whose strengths lie in being a participant. And your agency as a participant varies from game to game. And for The Last of Us series, there's no agency. We're not participating as ourselves, but as actors playing a role. It's kayfabe. We know it isn't real and there isn't a choice, but being a part of the illusion is enough. And that's not a lesser experience, just a different one. And the strength of this experience is about telling a specific story with specific characters, being a part of this finely tuned narrative. And part two has you take part in this violent world with a morally questionable protagonist. The game wants you to be conflicted with Ellie, and it's a tough pill to swallow if you just end up finding Ellie's actions more despicable than interesting. Cause like, you don't want to disconnect so hard from your protagonist that you don't want to play the game anymore, right? But interestingly enough, I didn't disconnect from Ellie because the game was too sad and horrific for me. It's actually the opposite. I was having too much fun with the game. The game's desire to be this emotional roller coaster while having fun gunplay is what's causing me to have this disconnect with the narrative. And my fun was in direct opposition with the narrative's goals. And here's the thing, writer Neil Druckmann said that he doesn't like using the word fun, but he instead uses engaging. And I agree with this sentiment. I like fun movies, but I also like engaging movies that aren't fun. And as much as I love fun games, why do all games have to be just fun? Obviously, fun is a subjective feeling, and what's considered fun to one is not fun to another. Just look at these Crocs. They're described as fun to wear. And in the case of part two, I find it's gameplay fun, or at the very least, it's not making me really think about the cycle of revenge. It's satisfying to headshot a guy. It's satisfying to stealth kill someone. It's satisfying tossing a brick, having a horde of zombies follow, then tossing a pipe bomb and killing all of them efficiently. This real-time gunplay isn't making me think about these NPCs in any meaningful way. Which is unfortunate, because the devs clearly want you to feel this way. Here, let me read you this quote. Even in gameplay, we want you to feel the micro-hard choices that these characters have to go through. So, are you going to confront the woman with the dog, or are you going to stealth around and take that risk? We want you to feel them in every decision you make. So guilt is very much a consequence, a repercussion of a choice, and not always, but often, it can also be a sign of learning and growing. And I get it, I see what they're trying to go for. I just didn't feel guilty for having to kill a person or their dog. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there where everyone is numb to violence, so I didn't feel all that emotionally swayed in this post-apocalyptic context. I have in other games and in various settings, just not in this one. Also, this thing on micro decisions, I never felt that either. As someone who's played the game on normal difficulty, it just felt easier and more engaging to tackle these obstacles head on. And even if I did feel bad and decide to approach everything more stealthily, while the quote states it's a sign of learning and growing, these actions don't reflect onto Ellie. There's no meaningful narrative or character significance if I decide to kill less people. So while you may learn and grow as the story progresses, Ellie just doubles down on her mission, furthering the disconnect between Ellie and yourself. And I felt that disconnects pretty hard in certain scenes, which I'll talk about later. So back to this, this quote is about you the player and not Ellie, since there's no way for Ellie to learn and grow until the story demands it. Remember, you're not you in this game, you're acting as Ellie. And again, this isn't a bad thing, it's just whether or not the game can achieve its authorial intent within its specific narrative experience. So does role-playing Ellie make me feel guilty and, ideally, explore those guilty feelings as Ellie?
And with the strict roleplay, I can't engage with the narrative's themes beyond going, I'm angry, let me kill people, I gotta get to Abby, let's go. There's no real pacifist mechanic. I mean, there is one mechanic. On occasion, an NPC will ask you to spare them. Which sounds neat, but all that happens when you spare someone is that they'll attempt to kill you later. I know violence begets violence and this is what I think this is supposed to communicate, but the moment I do want to engage with the game's themes as a player, the moment I partake in the conversation and want to learn and grow, the game immediately defaults to a predictable and uninteresting outcome. I would have liked more variety, especially since this feature was already in part 1 and I thought it would be expanded in part 2, but I'm instead met with a poorly implemented illusion of choice. And here's the thing, that's when I felt bad the most for the NPCs. I wanted to spare them, but it led me nowhere. And I wish the story and gameplay meshed together in a way that made me feel the way the devs wanted me to feel. I want to partake in the narrative and explore its themes, but Part 2's gunplay just isn't a great vessel in making me think about my micro decisions. As I successfully picked off people with my bow, I wasn't really thinking about the cycle of revenge or like the game's themes. I was having fun. Now look, I don't want to dismiss the feelings of people who got the game's intended effect. There are people who are engaged by the gameplay and felt horrified, and they're not wrong for feeling those feelings. But when it comes to how I felt, this mix of masterfully crafted sound effects, animations, and performances came together to create an immersive experience that feels more exciting rather than depressing. It felt pulpy, gory, and fun, like a Mortal Kombat game. It's impressive at least, since NPCs who yell out their names that aren't randomly generated seems like a technical nightmare. It just sucks that the novelty never worked on me. I felt worse killing Undertale's NPCs over gunning down dudes in Part 2. Which is a shame, because I feel like Part 2's desire to be this accessible third-person shooter was too fun for me to really stop and think about what I was doing. Which led me to think about games where I genuinely stopped and thought about what I was doing. And what came to mind was this moment where I had to choose between cutting one of my limbs and losing a party member. Not a fun situation to be in, right? In a game like Lisa the Painful, while it does have gameplay that can be considered fun, the game features segments where you're forced to make choices. Difficult choices that ask you what you think is more important. And these moments had me thinking about my actions more than any NPC screaming in my face. Aha, uh -huh, you might say. You said that Lisa the Painful has fun gameplay. That means fun is still present in the game. Therefore, fun is good, Lisa is fun, and thus, Lisa the Painful is good because it is fun. And yeah, I had fun with the game. The combat is reminiscent of Earthbound, there's a lot of charm in the art and the setting, and there's a great deal of humor that makes the game a lot of fun. But like, there's so much more to Lisa being a good game other than being just a fun and funny experience. But whatever, this argument seems to be obsessed with the idea that it's impossible for a game to be good without having some element of fun. So while the game has a lot of heavy moments, Maybe Lisa isn't the best example for my argument. There's too much fun and humor if you really want to be nitpicky about it. So is there a game where it's deliberately stressful, that's a reflexive, engaging experience, also containing micro decisions too, while frequently questioning your ethics and morals in a great setting, and feels more engaging rather than fun? In Papers, Please, you play as an immigration guard for the fictional country known as Artstotska. And all you do in this job is see if people should pass through the border by checking their papers. You must go through as many people as possible because it's tied to your income. And income is used to pay for your home and family fail to do so, then dire consequences are met. A wildly different premise from part 2 in just about every way, but it's through this context that Papers, Please achieves the goals that part 2 couldn't. So let's start with its gameplay. You wouldn't call Papers, Please a fun game in a traditional sense. The gameplay is paperwork, it's to the point, and it doesn't look glamorous. All you've got is the shuffling of papers, the non-voicing chatter of NPCs, and the tactility of your equipment. 
But because of all this, it creates this environment where the most interesting thing to do is your paperwork and, most importantly, how it affects the people you meet. So here's how the game goes. The game starts off simple enough, only accept people with passports and who are Archdotskin citizens. Easy, but as the days go on, the complexity is increased, thus making it longer to go through each person, thus making you want to go faster, thus increasing the likelihood of you messing up. And messing up could be as simple as failing to see that two documents have two different names. Something easy to miss in the middle of you doing your job. And when you do mess up, you're met with the most grating noise ever. And to add to this annoyance, the booth is too cramped for your papers. It's so small that it becomes frustrating shuffling through all these papers to find an error, which adds to the stress of the job. You can upgrade the station to make the job easier for you, but that costs credits, and credit is necessary to pay the bills. So you better be good with what you've got because juggling all these documents can feel insane. So you see what I mean, right? It's not a fun game, but I find it really engaging. It's an entrancing experience whose mechanics work well in making you feel stressed. And it doesn't feel cheap. It's your own fault you messed up, not the games. But all these rules just kind of feel like bull Exactly. This is done to show how cruel and strict Art Stotska is by making you feel frustrated by its rules. And by feeling this frustration, you start feeling more empathetic for these NPCs as they're going through that same frustration as well. And remember how I said gameplay is narrative? This is how Papers, Please interweaves the two, by putting you in the same positions as the NPCs. But unlike the NPCs, you have the choice to help them out. So if you haven't already noticed, whenever an NPC arrives, they talk to you. Some of what they say is simple, such as glory to Artstotska. Or it could be them complaining about the rules when you deny them their entry. But sometimes, these characters beg. They'll have a story about why they must get through the border and even admit that they don't even have the right documentation. The story could be about reuniting with a loved one, or escaping forced sex work. Sometimes NPCs aren't even asking to cross the border themselves. Sometimes they just want to give you tasks that must be done behind the back of your superiors. You don't know what it might lead to exactly, but you know, it could shake up the system at least. So on top of the stress of juggling paperwork, now your mind is clouded with all these questions. Do you want to help out these people or do you want to help out your family? Do you want to accomplish this mysterious task or not? A journalist investigating your country is asking to get through. He doesn't have the right papers though. Do you deny him? What about the alleged murderer who supposedly killed his girlfriend? A guard is he begging to let his papers. wife immigrate. Do you so really want to help out these What rebels? if a coworker so needs you? Do really you want to stay? Do you still want to help out these Do you have enough money to adopt your, 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 your niece? Why not your sick sister? Your son's birthday is coming up. Can you really afford today's living expenses if you're spending your credit on your son's birthday gift? These are conversations that organically present itself in Papers, Please, and having these thoughts compounded with the time limit is anxiety-inducing, and that anxiety stems from the consequences of your failure. And failure doesn't mean you're just losing arbitrary points. You're failing to help out your family. The game then becomes a conveyor belt of ethical dilemmas, and this gameplay loop engages with your empathy. And the game allows you to explore your feelings, but it demands you act fast, to act on impulse. And in a setting where you need to reinforce the status quo to care for your family, while also seeing the harm you inflict on others by doing so, it made me feel bad. So feel bad about these NPCs and your family? then you'll be caught between what you think is more important in the moment. What if you genuinely don't care about these people and want to protect your family at all costs? Then just treat them like nothing. These people are just numbers and you've got a job to do. You're not personally responsible for them, you're just following the rules. By the way, where do they keep the detainees? Sounds harsh, but that would be the best person to do the job, right? 
just a machine who gets the job done. So do whatever suits your playstyle, whether you're empathetic or a machine. Because within this context, Papers, Please is presenting whatever narrative that's built upon your choices. Choices that come from these scenarios that begin by starting a conversation. And from personal experience, I didn't have that just one more round type of fun that I usually expect from video games. I felt stressed. The anxiety that builds up when I clear someone waiting to see if I messed up, that never went away. And I've never felt more discomfort, disappointment, and anger from a game than I have with that fax machine sound. The sound of being bad at your job. The sound of losing money. The sound of failing your family. And even as I became better at my job by being more meticulous and numb to the NPC's plights, the stress never really went away. I still dreaded that fax. I still hated being awful to these people. And that's a really big achievement. The foundation of the game's gameplay is one that provides you an uncomfortable experience. An experience that felt engaging to me. It made me feel bad, but in a way that was intended. Whereas Part 2's gameplay doesn't do this. In Papers, Please, I'm engaging the NPCs as people. They're not target practice, for the most part. And no matter how much they scream their names and cry and weep, they're still faceless goons to me because the gameplay doesn't make me engage with them beyond faceless goon. And it's not like I can actually talk to them and discover something new about them in a different playthrough. They're not that type of NPC. They're basically a grunt. From a gameplay standpoint, they're no different to a cordyceps. So the only way to humanize NPCs, for me at least, is to approach them as people and to write them as interesting characters. This is what makes me feel guilty, but part two struggles to even do that. But hey, maybe that's a me issue regarding the gameplay. And to judge a franchise like The Last of Us solely on the gunplay would be ignoring a large chunk of the game's selling point this cinematic narrative. And while thematically the gunplay is supposed to affect how we feel in the moment, the cutscenes and walk and talks are where significant character moments are mostly presented. It's all about feeling like you're a part of a primetime TV show. And while I know some people don't like this sort of game, I don't think there's anything wrong with a game striving to be this linear cinematic experience. It's just a matter of preference and how it's implemented. And in part two's case, there are effective cutscenes and walk and talks. Any scenes involving Joel and Ellie and Abby and Lev are my favorite examples. Ellie struggling with her survivor's guilt and her love for Joel is a neat character study. She's the most emotionally complex character here, and some of the game's best moments come from exploring that complexity. And opposite to Ellie is Abby, who makes a simple and effective contrast to Ellie's story. While Ellie is at the beginning of her revenge path, Abby finds out connection heals her heart, at least in a way her revenge couldn't. And Lev being that connection to Abby is great. Best new character in the franchise. So where do my problems lie? With Abby, while I do like her character overall, the biggest issue I have with her story is that I don't really care about most of her friends. They're bland and they have no real character. They're just there to make us feel bad when the other shoe decides to drop. Abby's father is the worst here, with him written so transparently as, ooh, I'm such a good dad. It's incredibly eye-rolling and he may as well be on Ted Lasso. Owen has at least something going on for him, but as someone who loves love triangles, destructive romances, and unrequited love, his story is weak. So his death, while shocking, didn't feel as tragic as it ought to be. So if Abby's love interest, the person with arguably the most screen time with Abby, and the one with the most history with her, didn't really affect me, then you can imagine my disinterest for the rest of Abby's friends. Also, Abby doesn't even have a moment to really reflect on her friends' deaths. That feels like a massive thing that's been left unexplored. Ellie spends all game grieving for Joel. Why can't Abby grieve for her friends? Oh, speaking of Ellie. While Ellie has an even blander romance in a crew 
Haru I don't really care for. The biggest issue I have with her is her vengeance and how we interact with it. And the end result was me having a difficult time being Ellie, which led to me disconnecting from the narrative pretty hard. And I felt this most strongly when Ellie tortures Nora. And let me tell you why. Ellie is chasing Nora in order to find a lead on Abby's whereabouts. They find themselves in a place infected with spores and Nora begins to suffer. Ellie is willing to put Nora out of her misery if she provides some info. She refuses. So then, a prompt pops up to torture Nora. You have to do this to progress the game. There's no other choice. I bet a lot of people felt bad here, because it brings attention to the deliberateness of Ellie's actions. She could have stopped at any point, but she kept on going, and with every hit we felt that weight alongside her, and we suffered the consequences with her as well. It's a powerful moment, but it has been described as a little manipulative, so there have been mixed opinions on this scene. Because if you are someone deeply affected by this moment and you don't want to torture Nora, the game effectively stalls and Ellie is just gonna stand there forever. We don't want to beat Nora up, but we're gonna press it anyway because the game doesn't continue if we don't. Basically, we're doing it because we want to finish the game, not because we're, you know, in total alignment with the character. This emotional disconnect between player and character is no different to a press F to pay respect moment. So why not just make it a cutscene? Why do we have to press buttons? I'm assuming it's because of this, and kudos to the game, it got that specific response out of me. But remember when I said I started disconnecting from the narrative? It wasn't because of this moment, but rather what doesn't come after it. This traumatizing experience is never brought up again, nor does it affect Ellie's personality. There's no desire to be less cruel, attempt at rationalization, or expression of lingering regrets or second thoughts. Actually, she does self-reflect once in her diary, but those feelings aren't shown through cutscenes or gameplay, nor do those thoughts touch on Nora's torture and death. So it just feels like Ellie is back on her revenge path like usual. You do this, I'm not saving your ass again. The most character progression from her three days boils down to her doubling down on her revenge without question. So we're supposed to feel distraught by Ellie's actions by playing along with it. But Ellie doesn't follow through the emotional trauma that has affected her the same way we are. And I get that. But Ellie's lack of introspection ends up becoming a tiresome experience for me. Which in a temporal sense, Makes sense, because everyone reacts to trauma differently. Joel's death is fresh in her memory, and killing Abby seems like a surefire way to honor his death. Especially when violence was how Joel solved most of his problems, since he doesn't know any better. And the one time Joel decides to be more open, that's when he dies. Ellie is just mimicking the person she loves because violence seems like the solution that always works. But, as believable as her persistent vengeance is, it felt drawn out and narratively stagnant. In a revenge story like Vinland Saga, our main character experiences the atrocities of his revenge two episodes in after he swears his vengeance. And in between those episodes is a time skip where we assume he did a lot of horrible things. We could have spent seasons showing his persistence, but the story jumps to this part of his life because it's where his character begins to change. This is something that part one did as well. We kept jumping to more relevant times in characters' lives without dwelling on an emotion for too long. So it's not like the franchise is not familiar with this concept. And I wish part two continued to do something similar. Because in Ellie's story, we're still at a place where emotionally, it makes sense for her. But narratively, I would have liked more character development. She does feel shaken up after torturing Nora, but that doesn't change her in any meaningful way. Like seriously, I don't see her acting any differently between pre and post Nora's death. The same can be said when she kills Mel and finds out she's pregnant. 
she has a panic attack for killing her, but Ellie doesn't really address that moment, and the fact that there isn't an attempt at all is what's most disappointing. I mean, you could argue that maybe Ellie isn't emotionally articulate, and there isn't enough opportunity for her to bring up these heavy thoughts. Because like, how could she? She doesn't really know how to. And that's fair. But with how much she thinks about Joel's death in her journal, you'd think at least these big events would also make their way in there. But they don't. None of it touches on Mel, Nora, Dina's near death, Jesse's actual death, or Tommy's disability. And if you know me, I've been very critical of the Life is Strange franchise. I don't think their stories are any good. But at least these games have their characters explore their thoughts in their diaries. That's the reason why in-game journals exist, right? Why implement this mechanic if you're not gonna utilize it? So the emotional payoff, if there is any for these big moments, isn't enough for me to engage in their deaths beyond going, well, that sucks, if only Ellie turned back sooner. And thus, I don't feel like the game is starting a conversation with me. The game just wants me to go, oh my god, this is terrible, isn't this terrible? Oh my god. And I understand that I'm not supposed to completely agree with Ellie's actions. I understand her motivations, and I totally get why she does what she does. I just want my awful, morally questionable characters to be interesting. And Ellie's morality can be interesting to me. But the way the story is structured ends up being too uninteresting and repetitive for me. I didn't find it interesting when Ellie prioritized her revenge over Dina. I didn't find it interesting when Ellie prioritized Abby over Tommy. And I didn't find it interesting when Ellie felt bad for killing these people, but was unaffected by the trauma. And I didn't find it interesting that we had to play several hours of gameplay to get to these moments and then barely get any character progression at all. It's just miserable moment after miserable moment and I'm uninterested in this constant unchanging misery, which dilutes the misery and makes it lose its shock value when there isn't anything to follow it up. I wanted more sequences that confront her feelings. I wanted more moments where she second guesses herself. I wanted scenes where she tries to explore other ways to heal her trauma, but ultimately gets back on the hunt. I'm not asking for a therapy session or anything like that. I just wanted to experience more feelings beyond her persistence, such as exploring Joel's home or the emotional trauma from her panic attack. I like these moments, but they're too infrequent to break up the monotony of her vengeance. But what about the flashbacks? Don't they provide breathers in between the vengeance? Yes, they do. And while these scenes are necessary to give insight into Ellie's relationships between part 1 and 2, they don't motivate Ellie to act differently in the present, except for one moment, but we'll address that scene soon. But for the most part, it's not like Joel nudging Ellie to be safer in the past is like a reminder to be more cautious in the present. I want Ellie to change, I want Ellie's beliefs challenged, but with how infrequent this happens, I'm just exhausted with how little happens to Ellie. Especially when the most significant change in Ellie's character only happens after you play 90% of the game, which includes playing the entirety of Abby's story. It takes about 20 hours to get here. I get why they did it, and I have enjoyed stories that feature a big break from the main character, but this felt clunky and emotionally unfulfilling to me, which also describes my feelings on the game's ending. So here's how I see it. Ellie sparing Abby's life thematically makes the most sense to me. I just think its execution lacked the foundation to support it. So, let's look back at what we've talked about. In a game that wants guilt out of you as you experience kill after brutal kill throughout your entire journey, Ellie not wanting to kill Abby doesn't sound like a crazy narrative conclusion. And in a story about forgiveness and connection being a way to mend one's heart, Ellie refusing to kill Abby is her finally accepting how selfish her journey has been, a selfishness she acknowledges at the start of day three in her journal. And on top of that, this is Ellie's way of forgiving Joel, 
since this memory we see here was her last conversation with him, explicitly stating how difficult it would be to forgive him, but wanting to try anyway. If somehow the Lord gave me a second chance at that moment, I would do it all over again. I don't think I can ever forgive you for that. But I would like to try. I like that. So to me, it makes sense why Ellie lets go and why she needs to let go. It's her abandoning her destructive path and the guilt that came with that. And as much as she thought it was about Joel, she actually realizes it's about herself. And with that, this becomes her first step in acknowledging her selfishness and how unhealthy that was. But despite that acknowledgement, it comes too late. She has lost everything and her worst fears become reality. You are treading on some mighty thin eyes here. I'm sorry about your daughter, Joel, but I have lost people too. You have no idea what loss is. Everyone I have cared for has either died or left me. Everyone except for you. So don't tell me that I would be safer with someone else because the truth is I would just be more scared. But I don't buy it. While I do think Ellie should have spared Abby to coincide with the game's themes, and while I do believe Ellie is capable of forgiving Abby, I don't think the game laid enough groundwork for me to believe Ellie's forgiveness. It's kill, 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 but then don't kill. I mean, you could argue that she didn't want to experience the trauma of killing Mel and Nora and, you know, alongside the death of her friends. But she still approaches this scene guns a-blazing. Where's the trauma there? These are awful people, yes, but the whole game is built upon the idea that every NPC has a story. It's not like you're morally in the clear for killing these awful people. What if Ellie recognizes this cycle of revenge but didn't want to continue it? It doesn't really stop the cycle, since she clearly killed all those people with no issue. What's stopping any of their close friends and relatives continuing the cycle by, you know, hunting Ellie? Forgiveness I can buy, but stopping the cycle? I believe a little less, both thematically and practically. Maybe this is Ellie's way of acknowledging Lev's actions. Since the reason why Dina and JJ are even alive and they're able to live their dream life on our ranch with sheep and stuff, um, it, all of that is possible because of Lev's morality. But as Ellie threatens Abby with Lev's life to start their MGS4 fight, I highly doubt that. And regardless of any rebuttal, it all comes down to this for me. Throughout Ellie's chapters, 99% of it has been about her doubling down on her decisions, ignoring what little friction she comes in contact with. Her story isn't a slow, encroaching realization. It's the onceler realizing that cutting down the last tree suddenly made him feel bad. And because of this, I feel like Ellie's plot leans towards a sunken cost mindset instead of this forgiveness route. She was willing to risk her dream life with Dina for this, and a journal entry from forever ago and a memory of Joel just doesn't convince me. When you're in a death struggle, lose everything and have killed countless people to get here, and throughout your entire journey, your arc has been about sticking to your decisions, 
You just don't spare the murderer who killed someone that meant the world to you. And as someone who likes Abby's character, I don't want to kill Abby, but for some reason, Ellie doesn't want to kill Abby too, despite not knowing anything substantive about Abby's history or relationships. I assume that's why the game is structured as Ellie first and Abby second, so you can be like, Oh no, I remember killing this dog, this dog that everybody loved in Abby's section. But even in an ideal setting where I fell in love with the cast and were horrified by their deaths, it doesn't stop the fact that Ellie still doesn't know the people she's killed. From her perspective, Abby's crew is no different to any other wolf she's gunned down. So Ellie goes out of her way doing the same thing she's always done, finally reaches her goal, and then stops at the last moment because she thought about Joel. It feels kind of cheap to me. And it feels cheap because the game wants me to feel bad without the components that would allow me to feel bad. Like, we're supposed to feel bad about all these NPCs, but the game doesn't react in an interesting way if I try to engage with it. The best I can do is stealth, but will just inevitably do another horrible thing that robs their sense of agency. We're supposed to feel bad about the death of Abby's friends, but the game doesn't really address them, and the game fails to pay off a lot of its setups. And we're supposed to feel bad when we're fighting Abby. So bad, in fact, that we wouldn't want to kill her. And in a game that forces the player to feel the weight and cruelty of Ellie's actions, unable to change her no matter how much we try, I wish Ellie went through with it. Because we're not Ellie, we're acting as Ellie. And because of this, I think the most appropriate ending, as tragic as it is, is to have Abby die. Ellie's actions can't convince me otherwise, which tells a different and less hopeful story. While Abby discovers what it takes to mend her mind, she can't escape the pain she inflicted on others, so she suffers the consequences, and Ellie, despite achieving her goal, doesn't get the closure she wants and loses everything in the process. But obviously, it doesn't happen this way. Instead, the game just forces a moment to happen because it's a dramatic moment, and this isn't the first time the game has done this. Why doesn't a survival expert like Ellie secure her base better? None of this would have happened if she just, you know, did something about that ladder. How did Mel even get all the way to the aquarium all by herself? Just look at how much effort Abby and Ellie put in just to get here. And why does Ellie unequip her silencer if you had it on prior to encountering Nora? You shoot me. The sound will help every soldier come running. You'll still be dead. Linear narratives have the advantage of structuring their game's events for a specific and rigid reason. There's no need to juggle several branching narratives. It's this scene, this scene, and then this scene. But despite this advantage, the story's final cut still has these forced moments. And while I could easily forgive these three examples, the ending sticks out the loudest for me. This forced moment complaint is one I've often tossed to David Cage games like Detroit Beyond and Heavy Rain, something you're quite familiar with if you've been following the channel for quite some time. And while it's nowhere near as frequent and egregious as those games, Part 2 still forces characters into feelings regardless of the circumstances. And without tight and straightforward Part 1 was, I thought Part 2 would be just as tight as well. But hey, with how divisive Part 2's ending is, it got me thinking. What if Part 2 took a page out of Life is Strange's book and provided choice, specifically for the ending? to kill or to spare Abby. I think this would be interesting since it would force players to confront their actual feelings for Abby after walking in her shoes. Would you kill or spare Abby because you'd think it'd honor Ellie and Joel's feelings? Or would you pick one based on your personal feelings for Abby? At the very least, the debate that would come out of this would be more interesting and nuanced than Life is Strange's ending. But hey, the game wanted a specific story to tell. And as it is now, 
I'm left kind of disappointed and numb. And in a game that wants me to feel the weight of my actions by hoping that I'd drown in my own guilt, feeling numb to all this effort, to all this budget and crunch work, is what actually made me feel bad. You know what I like about Shadow of the Colossus? The game made me feel bad, because in a game where the whole point is to kill these massive creatures, where the songs can sound super exhilarating, delivering the final blow always ends in this song. <laughs> Instead of fanfare, I was met with what felt more like a game over theme. And in a game where the entire goal is to kill these colossi, why is it making me feel bad? Despite my feelings, I felt intrigued because I wanted to know what was at the end of my journey. This journey of our silence protagonist where all he wants to do is revive this lady which we don't know anything about. Whoever she is, our protagonist will evidently do everything he can to save her life. But judging by his moveset, he can't do much. He can shoot, climb, stab, and ride his horse, but that's it. In the context of a video game hero, it's unimpressive, but it works. If our hero could hack, slash, jump, run, and do some Devil May Cry combat, this would make the deaths of the Colossi feel tacked on. It'd draw a lot more focus on how cool our hero is compared to what we're supposed to feel. We're supposed to focus on the Colossus and what we're doing to it. So there's something about the simplicity of Wander's actions, the struggle and stamina it takes to topple a Colossus over that adds to the game's character. Because worrying about supplies and inventory micromanagement in the heat of battle doesn't lend itself well to a somber experience. It's not an action game, and it doesn't want to be. The game is barren of enemies beyond the Colossi, and all you have to do is go from one to another, traversing this huge space. And taking down a Colossus is more in line with a puzzle game than a third-person hack-and-slash. But as far as puzzle games go, it can sound pretty exciting. Just listen to this classic soundtrack. Take note, though, of the music and what you're seeing, and the contrast this makes. This isn't combat with video gamey pain. The colossi cry and moan with every stab. It's a slow process, and with how long it takes to commit to each stab and how infrequent it happens throughout each fight, it brings attention to how painful it is, while also being a dramatic beat in gameplay, which then crescendos into the final blow. And each death is given this dramatic weight, as if the game wants you to know something important was lost. It's a bizarre feeling, and I felt conflicted, but I persisted anyway. And once you've completed the game, all these feelings start to make sense. Oh, and remember how I said there's nothing inherently wrong with the illusion of choice? This game has one, and is contextualized in a way where your struggle for choice makes sense, and it's fantastic. Genuinely one of my favorite moments in a video game. This isn't the most complex story, but it's a game that showed how emotionally moving it can be to be the protagonist. And by the time the final moments of the game happened, I felt really bad for killing these colossi. Now, I'm not sharing this as a way to dunk on part two with a game from 2005. 
I'm sharing this because part two's desire to make me feel guilty in a linear narrative isn't a far-fetched idea, because I've felt these feelings before. I felt guilty for killing the Colossi, but I continued anyway. I was shocked by my actions when the narrative revealed something new to me, and I accepted that, since there was no other way for the story to play out. Guilt, shock, and acceptance. These are narrative beats present in part 2 that didn't resonate with me but were possible in another game. And if you see me preferring Papers, Please and Shadow of the Colossus over Part 2, and the conclusion you get is, cinematic games are destined to be bad, that's not the point I'm trying to make. The first Last of Us is proof enough to me that they can at least be decent, so Part 2 cinematic nature isn't the problem but more so how its gameplay failed to engage me with its themes. And the best way the game thought it could do that is through third-person gunplay. But we know why Part 2 does this, right? It's for broad appeal. The act of shooting and violence is a great way to sell a game. It's familiar, shooting is an immediate form of gratification, and it just looks and sounds cool. But is this form of gameplay the best way to make me feel bad about these characters? Personally, I don't think so. At least not for me. In Shadow of the Colossus, it made me feel bad for killing these colossi. In Papers, Please, it made me confront my morality. That made me feel bad, but also engaged. And in The Last of Us, I didn't feel bad. I felt detached and no amount of screaming will make me feel bad if there isn't enough substance to back up the story. And Ellie's ending exemplifies that. Which sucks, because I commend Part 2 on its boldness, lending itself to some of the game's best highlights. So it's not like Part 2 lacks any merit at all, I just think my issues with the game greatly outweigh its highlights. But hey, Hopefully my experience with part 2 isn't going to ruin your time with the game. And people shouldn't feel bad about liking a game someone else critiques. I just found other games more effective in evoking certain feelings in me. And part 2 failing to make me feel the thing the devs want me to feel was my biggest issue. In a game about wanting to start a conversation, despite its best attempts at saying something hopeful, it's overshadowed by Ellie's laser-focused revenge. And I'd prefer Ellie's other feelings to be explored with more substance. But it doesn't. So I'm stuck here. And there's nothing else I can do besides hit square. Anyway, let's hope the HBO adaptation ends up becoming a more captivating experience for me. And as someone who likes the show more than part one, I'm pretty excited. I know I'm in the minority for this, so if you're curious about my insight on the show, uh, yeah, check out my video if you want. Anyway, thank you for watching and thank you to my patrons for supporting me and helping me avoid certain sponsors and solely relying on YouTube income. Because worrying about monetization and money ain't great for my mind. As tempting as it is, I don't want to shill some crappy thing, and I haven't found a sponsor yet that I'm like comfortable enough to partner up with. So for now, I'd rather sustain myself through crowdfunding. If you want to show some gratitude but only want to donate once, you can do so through the super thanks function or go through PayPal. It would mean a lot if you did that, but you know, only do that if you're financially stable. If you want to support me on a more consistent basis though, then consider my Patreon, which includes a free trial if you're curious to see what it's like. Which includes being a part of an exclusive Discord community that has behind the scenes stuff, getting your name credited or getting a shout out in the video, and getting first dibs on commissions. Speaking of, it's time to thank these patrons. So again, thank you for watching, and specifically, thank you to Francisco Romero, Tailored Muffin, Hunch, Riamrez, Riamrez, Yumi, Astra, Dan Brown, Bohemian Bison, Sailor Dog, Niz, Common Russ, Vistustila, 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 Cellorf Seven O O Seven. Ratlung, RQ52, Bad Bad Randy, Jaylon JMS, Carl Durocher, Tutbot, Taboo TV Cat, Zuli, Enormous98, Sylph, Keo, Aerobic Brock, Seti, Ash, Malthus1, R, Jakey N, 
Trevor Hoppen, Parker Murphy, Coda, Ashtat, Steph, Johnnyboy123, Joe Bot, The Raspberry, Katzmeyer, and Babtard, Text is too small. Damn. Hmm. Alright. Okay, cool. You can read that. I'm out of focus, but you can or it's for them. Gob Gob. Kyan, Detective Nanami and Neon Phantasma, Psycho and Kizza, Skylar, Zendictive, Subrethan, Red, Axon8, Dave6566. So yeah, that's basically it. Thank you for watching and thank you for the support.